Good afternoon, I'm Linda Morban, uh, CEO of Capricor, as Ren just said. Um, we're a publicly traded company, NASDAQ listed, and this is our standard forward-looking statement. So we have two products uh, in our pipeline. The company was founded 12 years ago as a regenerative medicine company um, on some of the foundational principles that um, are no longer holding water, which is that our cell, now called CAP1002, um, was a stem cell that would be put into an injured tissue, in our situation, the heart. It would uh, engraft into uh, that injured tissue and become part of it and ultimately um, help repair the, the heart in that way, and it's called regenerative medicine. What we've learned in our 12-year journey as a company is, in fact, the cells don't work uh, that way at all. And it's allowed us to go from first an autologous cell therapy to an allogeneic off-the-shelf cell therapy, and also to shift our focus towards what we know the cells do, which is really a primary role in immunomodulation. And I'll talk more about that in the next few minutes. Um, and they work primarily through paracrine signaling methods, so the cells deliver um, a message in terms of um, the exosomes, um, our other product in our pipeline, which I'll talk just a little bit about today. So the exosomes are the new product in regenerative medicine. And I think in the next few years, uh, the chairs in this room will be filled by people who are familiar with and interested in exosomes, because what we've learned and what our colleagues are learning in the space is that a lot of these mechanism of actions of cell therapies are mediated by the exosomes. And the exosomes are tiny little bubbles essentially filled with RNAs, proteins, and a little bit of DNA that transmit cellular messages. And the best way to think about an exosome is if you think about the words that I am delivering to you right now, I'm telling you a message. It might change your behavior, but it won't change you. And that's exactly how an exosome works. It changes the behavior of a cell without changing the cell itself. And I'll go into that in a little more detail in a few moments. So we are currently working on Duchenne muscular dystrophy as our primary indication for our cell therapy product, CAP-1002. And what we want to really emphasize here is that CAP-1002 becomes a very powerful tool in the toolbox to treat Duchenne muscular dystrophy. In Duchenne and some of these other monogenic disorders, there are some standard features of these diseases that involve both the defect that's created in the gene that leads to some type of functional defect, which in this case is skeletal muscle um, denigration over time because of the lack of the dystrophin protein um, that potentially could be replaced or repaired by gene therapy. There's also a strong inflammatory component to these diseases. And we need to be able to take care of both fixing the gene and also controlling the inflammation. I was really pleased today in some of the panels to hear a word that I use all the time, but I haven't heard commonly um, in the field, which is immunomodulation. And I think what we're learning, and the field of immunology is just exploding in the last few years, is that there are a balance between pro-inflammatory and anti-inflammatory factors in our bodies all the time. And the goal of controlling inflammation is not just to suppress inflammation, but to actually cause good response by the immune system and some of the interleukins like elevation of IL-10, which we know our cells do. So what I'm saying here is that CAP-1002 is a perfect partner for any of the other gene therapies and disease-modifying therapies that are in development in Duchenne muscular dystrophy, and that's how we're going to be building out this program. Right now, we are working on a, what we think to be will be a pivotal trial, a potential registration in Duchenne. We had some really interesting clinical data in the HOPE-1 clinical trial last year showing both improvements in cardiac structure and function, which is what we were targeting, and also skeletal muscle function, which is what we'll be going after um, as a primary efficacy endpoint in HOPE-2. We have RMAT designation, uh, which is, as everybody in this room is probably aware of, the breakthrough designation for cellular therapies. So we're going to be able to access the FDA along our journey and potentially get as close as we possibly can towards registration um, from this clinical trial and uh, look for that trial to start uh, any day now. And then, of course, the exosomes will be coming into the clinic uh, in the next year. And uh, we'll look forward to updating you on that indication and that that program. Thank you. Grab a seat. Um, so you already talked a little bit about how 
you went from uh, kind of cardiovascular indication to DMD, and I think that's it's a good sign that it kind of tells us as, as analysts and investors that you're a company that follows the science and what the data is instead of just being pigeonholed for what, what you want. But can you talk a little bit more about that process and you know how you went from cardiovascular arena to DMD? So this is actually um, one of my favorite subjects because I've been involved in this company since its uh, founding. I'm actually a founder of the company. And as I s sort of briefly mentioned, we founded this company on principles that the cells were of stem cell-like nature and that they would be good then at repairing the injured tissue, in our case the heart, because our cells come from the heart. Um, and so what we learned along the way and ultimately helped us uh, change directions was the fact that the cells don't work that way. They work by these paracrine mechanisms, as I mentioned. And so some of our initial data in the Caduceus clinical trial show that we could reduce the amount of scar in the heart. And what we thought was going on there was that it was act the cells were actually reducing the scar. What we know now is that probably what was happening in the early post-MI period, post-heart attack period, was that the cells were actually controlling the spread of the scar controlling the inflammatory processes and therefore looks like reducing the amount of scar and causing a functional improvement. That didn't bear out in the all-star phase two clinical trial. It was hard to measure that endpoint of reduced scar. Uh, we saw some really nice functional recovery um, in our heart failure program and, and hope to continue that at some point. But when we became aware of the fact that this immunomodulatory component driven by the exosomes, which we now have drill down even to understanding the microRNAs that are activating these pathways, we realized that what we needed to do is go after diseases where first you can immunomodulate. So if you think about it um, as a garden, the first thing that you want to do when you start with a plot of land is get out the weeds, right? Make sure that the, the soil is cleared. And then once the soil is clear, you can plant your flowers, you can tend them and grow them. You can think about cellular therapies in the same way. You deliver your cells, it clears out those weeds, which is the inflammatory processes, and then you allow new muscle to grow. And that's what we believe is happening in Duchenne. So let's talk a little bit about the HOPE study and HOPE2, right? Yeah. Um, and so I guess the first thing is what key data would you point investors to um, you know, from, the, from the HOPE study? You know, what, what should they take home? Uh, from that. And then I think importantly, right, because now all the attention is focused on HOPE 2, um, kind of, you know, and you've spent a lot of time maximizing, you know, how the, the success of that trial. What are the changes that you've made and what was the rationale for making those changes? Yeah, so HOPE 1 um, was a randomized open label study of 25 patients with fairly advanced uh, Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Um, actually, 80% of those patients were non-ambulant any longer, um, and they typically were older. Um, we originally biased towards that older patient population because we were developing our therapy to treat the cardiomyopathy associated with DMD. And we did this first clinical trial to see if we could safely infuse cells into the hearts of these boys and young men with Duchenne. The data from that trial was incredibly interesting and actually very exciting because we made several observations that actually correlated beautifully with the preclinical data, but there's nothing nicer than seeing correlation of preclinical data with clinical data. And just sort of to articulate that, we did see improvement in cardiac structure in terms of the reduction and the amount of scar in the heart of the boys with Duchenne. And if you know anything about this progressive disease, there's usually no way that you would ever see an improvement without some type of therapeutic. So we believe that the reduction in scar was directly related to the delivery of the cells. The kids with the, got the cells had a reduction in scar. They saw an improvement in a measure of cardiac function measured by MRI called systolic thickening. Systolic thickening is very important in Duchenne muscular dystrophy because it's one of the major ways that those hearts can contract, and it's sort of a detailed reason why, but suffice it to say it was a very strong indicator that the cells were leading to a functional improvement in the heart. None of the other therapeutics being developed for Duchenne are having an impact in the heart disease, which is the major cause of death in these boys and young men. Additionally, and very exciting for us, was we also saw improvements in the performance of the upper limb, which is the ability of these boys and young men to move their arms. And this is very important. This is 
something that for these patients is remarkably important. It is the ticket to independence. And they're men, you know, between the ages of 17 and 22. They want to be able to drink. They want to be able to eat. They want to be able to move their wheelchairs. They've been off their feet long enough that they don't crave the, the idea of getting back on their feet. They just want to maintain or improve what they have. Um, so this uh, observation that they had improvements in their arm function was very relevant and very important. Um, HOPE 2, what did we learn in HOPE 1 and what did we translate to HOPE 2 is very exciting. So as Ren said, and I thank you for this because I'm a scientist by background and so I really do let the science guide the medicine. And what we discovered along the way, um, doing more preclinical work as we were also doing the HOPE 1 study are two very important points. One is that delivering the cells into the coronary circulation, actually doing uh, intracoronary delivery, was not important to mediate the beneficial effects of the cells. We could deliver them to any blood vessel in the body and get the cells to do the same work. We understand the biodistribution and the clearance and how that happens, and I can answer any questions and follow follow up, we're short on time today, obviously. Um, but suffice it to say, we know that. So we were able to switch to an IV delivery uh, for the cells instead of intracoronary. That opened up an incredibly important opportunity, which is the second point we want to make, which is that we were able to take the dose of cells and double it. So we're giving 150 million cells instead of 75. And because we're not putting a catheter into somebody's heart, we can then repeat dose. So we saw the most improvement in skeletal muscle function over the first three months in uh, this HOPE-1 trial. And so what we're going to do is repeat dose every three months. So the kids will get four doses in a year. Uh, we're going to look and do an interim look at six months, and then we're going to uh, look again at 12 months. Uh, the FDA has supported the idea of the performance of the upper limb, the mid-level, which is the movement of the arm, um, as a primary efficacy endpoint. Um, and we anticipate to enroll 84 patients in this random randomized double-blind placebo-controlled trial, 10 to 12 sites in the United States. Um, we have a waiting list of patients already. Um, Craig McDonald is our um, national PI, uh, has been involved in pretty much every one of the major Duchenne initiatives, so we're excited to have him. So um, that's a good segue into, you know, you're, you're working with one of the thought leaders in DMD. Um, maybe just your thoughts on, on the types of patients you're targeting, just so the audience understands that it's not like you're going up against Sarepta, right? So thank you for asking that because that's also a very important point. We're targeting the older patients in Duchenne, as I alluded to a, a few minutes ago. Um, when I looked, and this was admittedly a few months ago, there were 103 clinical initiatives in Duchenne muscular dystrophy on clinicaltrials.gov. Three of them were targeting these older patients, and one of those three was a registry. So, you know, there's not a lot of options. And... We think of these patients um, like stage four cancer patients. They have no other options really in front of them. There's not a lot of clinical trials available to them. They're trying to hold on to or maintain what they have. They want to live long, healthy lives. And so we feel very um, proud of the fact that we're targeting and allowing these older patients to have an opportunity for a therapeutic. And the FDA realizes these patients are uh, the most needy in terms of clinical development as well, which is helpful. So maybe just related to that, you know, what are the opportunities or have you started looking even preclinically um, to move further upstream um, where, right. you know, is, it potential, is there a potential for it to be combined with other um, DMD therapeutics at earlier stages? Right. So um, one of the things that we're doing um, is we're establishing partnerships now with some of the companies that are developing gene therapies with the idea of looking at um, combination therapies of the future. And that's um, exactly what we're going to be doing and, and look for us to start talking about that a little more as data comes out. So in the last, like, 45 seconds... I'm a fast talker. E exosomes. Yeah. Um, so you're the second company talking about it, seems like this is an, an area that all of us should be, should be focusing on, um, you know, yeah. kind of why. And so exosomes are the opportunity for this field to take the power and the energy of the cell without having to go through the laborious manufacturing of a cell, right? And also keeping that cell alive because the idea is you have to deliver the living cell. And so with exosomes, um, there's some patented technology that we have where you can lyophilize them, that makes turn them into a powder, you can resuspend them, you can deliver them anytime. You have much greater therapeutic opportunities, and the beneficial effect seems the same, if not better, than the cells. This is actually the, the 
I don't want to call it the secretions of these stem cells, but, but really um, right. it, it is, right? I mean, it's the, the therapeutic potential that's getting secreted out as, as packaged paracrine molecules? I that's guess. exactly right. So they're nanometer sized lipid bilayer vesicles, which means they're a millionth of a millimeter in their size, and they're packed with RNAs and proteins. We've popped ours open, and we know the active components inside, so you can actually pluck out the active RNA species. We have, we've identified now about 10,000 RNA species in ours. About 1,000 of them seem to change over time, and then there's just a couple that change a lot. Um, and what I'll say um, about that is every cell makes exosomes. Milk has exosomes in it, and beer has exosomes in it, and they are the communication tools of cells. Um, and so what we're able to do now is harness that by ha taking cells, um, exposing them to conditions, collecting those exosomes, and then telling cells to do what the cells were trying to do themselves. Great. Linda, thank you very much. Thank you, Ren. It's always a pleasure.